The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. Well, when I started running, I suppose I didn't stop, and when I got the chance to go, I said I should go, and so I opened up. We were only the small little fish out there, so we are, and uh, we're trying hard to make it through. But it's hard to get the breaks when you're the smaller fish. Because I love this county so much, you know, and it's just, I'm delighted that the lads, the lads did it for the people of Walford today, because, like, I, I'm, har- I'm heartbroken. <laughs> about Cara Finn, Conan. It's all about Cara Finn. The greatest ever club team. Are we going to go down that road? That's open, open to opinion. I don't think I'm going to go down that road. But it's absolutely an incredible, incredible performance against uh, Croke's team who were all in Champions 2017. Now, they didn't show up in the day, but could they show up against an awesome team? Could Nemo show up against an awesome team? Could Slocknail, who we know are a bloody battle-hard and good team, yeah. could they show up? They won their last three All-Irelands by a cumulative total of 37 points. <laughs> so, like, I mean, it's beyond belief. They won by 10 against Slocknail, they won by 15 last year, and they won by 12 against Crokes. Like, three solid, bloody good club teams. Croke Park suits them. They love it. They're a brilliant, brilliant team. It's just, there's, there's not much more you can say about Curra Finn. The clay football, that's breathtaking. The angles of the runs, the style of play. They can mix a running hand passing game up with a kick passing game, diagonal balls. They have it every way. They can hurt you so many different ways. They have a dominating, m- marauding midfield that you're not going to get anything off. Like yeah. They're going to beat you probably in the air if you go long to midfield. They have forwards that can win any game that are practically six, arguably, inter-county, division three minimum yeah. uh, level forwards. And then their defence, their attacking, ha- attacking wing backs and Tigers full back line. Like I mean, <laughs> there's just no, there's no weaknesses. There's no, they, they look like a county team. They, yeah. That's how, that's the best compliment. They don't look like a club team. They look like a county team. Like a very good county team. I mean, when you think you've scored a goal against them, Kieran Fitzgerald's there blocking on the line then as well, just throwing his body in the way. Yeah. It's just so like stingy with the opposition. Like yeah. every single thing you could want in a team, they, they haven't. I have no idea how you would even begin preparing for them like I was watching I was sitting in front of Pat O'Shea you know for the whole game and watching him and it just looked like looked awful for him like you know he's he's losing his rag rightly so but the only way you can prepare for them is to go back to under eights and get a team ready in 20 years time to play them like you know there's no way Crokes froze now Crokes did freeze on the Mm. day there was a combination now but like I mean like I said did Slocknail freeze and did Nemo freeze it's obviously the the credit goes to Curra Finn yeah but Jesus, it looked like men against boys, didn't it? Like, I mean, it men against boys. It looked like an under-21 team versus a seasoned yeah. senior team. It did. Like, it, there was a, a Dublin lad in the crowd shouting out, Dr. Chokes! Doctors! <laughs> and I was like, ah, here, they're just being, like, having the floor wiped with them. Like, they're just... They had them every way, as you said. And, yeah, like, I, I don't know, like, what... Like, did Croaks choke? Or was it just Cora Finn were so good? Like, were they even better than we gave them credit for? Yeah. I know we backed them on Thursday, but... Were they just thank God, we, thank God we backed them. And how did the bookies have it really even money? But I suppose this is all hindsight stuff. But the, Gar- the Gary Sice goal, Sice was brilliant again. He's a real smart, intelligent player. And for a fellow who played a lot of wing back at inter-county level, he's just a brilliant, brilliant playmaking forward. Um, great passer of the ball. But like, I mean, this just sums them up. And we know about the, the hand pass and um, the hand pass and goal they scored against Nemo. And it was used as the reason not to limit the hand pass. But this wasn't as good as that, but it was on a similar level. So I think it was Farrah running through. And it was the run by Dahi Burke, right? So Dahi Burke didn't just run a support line beside him. Dahi Burke cuts yeah. across him. And I was tagged in a tweet over the weekend um, by Aidan O'Mahony. And it was a bit of fun, really. They were talking about the three-man weave. And what a waste of a drill <laughs> yeah. that every team in the country does. And they've done all their lives. And I was thinking to myself, that's funny. And I get what you're saying. But I was always thinking the three-man weave is completely misunderstood. The three-man weave has always been, let's just do this to warm up. There's never been... uh, I've done that three-man weave so many times and no management team has ever, ever explained why you're doing that. Like, I mean, I would think the three-man weave would be a great drill to drill into your full back line, working the ball out the field. So when your full full back has it that he's not just going on his own, that there's lads cutting off him at angles and, and giving him a support run. But this is what it's all about, a support run and angles. The angles are killing you. So it was Doddy Burke cutting behind him mm. and Farher, Farher almost with a sixth sense giving it off to him. He's dragging players that way and does the ball end up the side Dottie Burke runs? Of course not. Yeah. It's going to be shipped back to Sice who, has, who was pleading with Farher in the first place. 
but he knew right well maybe if I give it across the size he's going to get closed down let's use this uh, runner Dahi Burke to drag lads out of there and it ended across with size who just pounds it into net it's just beautiful stuff but it's like that three man weave angles of running everybody always says it like uh, give the man on the ball loads and loads of options yeah. that's what you want you always want options especially up front yeah give, give and go as well so once you give it you're not done like you're yeah. giving it and you're going around the back on another angle of a run and I think the better coaches what they would do is introduce a defender in there three man weave so it's three on one then and then you're getting a pass to defender and then you're, it's not the same sort of robotic thing that you're doing like the best teams in the in the country like Vincent's and like Horrifin they sniff out when they've got an extra man and that's when the three man weave comes into it then because two or three of you are targeting that extra man or the extra two men, whatever amount you have over, and then you go at you go at that space like, and that's like what Corfin did, and he just passed it the whole way into the net. It was unreal, like, and everybody's active in the forward line, every single one of them, always moving, always coming into space, and yeah, just they're always there, like, and, and they're actually genuinely showing for it. They're not just moving for the sake of it. Yeah, it's, it was absolutely unbelievable. There was only seventeen thousand eight hundred nineteen people in Croke Park. It usually averages around thirty thousand. That was really disappointing. Now. They both have to travel a fair distance. I don't think either Corrafin or Crokes are very well supported. Thomas is only a tiny little village. Bally Hill is only a little village. So it's probably the four teams that were well yeah. in. Although, like, I mean, what club team is supported? Two villages, we're saying, aren't well supported. And then and then Crokes, which a town team, they're not well supported. Corrafin is is a kind of an area team. So I don't know. I think it's it's about time that we've talked about this enough times that that, that, uh, that match is moved out of Paddy's Day. There's it's hard to get in around Dublin on that day. You know what I mean? With all the parades yeah. and stuff like that. Do you really want to drive in? You might not know Dublin that well. You're from, uh, you know, different parts of the country. It's off-putting. It's on the telly. Yeah. I think it's only die-hard club fans are going to these matches now. Yeah. And like, there were any neutrals that might have gone? Like, du- Dublin were playing the night before and they all freeze their bollocks off in Crow Park on Saturday night watching Tyrone beat them. So, you know, you sort of, like, the inter-county scene swallowed it up a little bit as well. Where It's always St. Patrick's Day, but it's usually during the week on St. Patrick's Day, so it's it's out on its own. Yeah, like yeah, you know, that's like, it. The weekend didn't help, yeah. Yeah, like, we, we talked about having December, like, and I could genuinely see 40, 50,000 people coming in December as the last game of the year, and, like, you know, it's been building up to this. We're all in club mode. There's no other big game on. There are so many big games at the weekend there. Or if you put it in December to end the year, yeah. I think it would be a real feast. Yeah, where it's not diluted. So, like, I mean, the Croaks sending off their captain, um, John Payne. It was on Leonard, was it? Was it the kick out was on Leonard, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was, yeah. But I don't think, I think Leonard made the most of that. I don't think he made contact with his mouth. It was actually a weird one. He did kick up. I wouldn't have sent him off for that. I think that that's more Ooh. out of frustration. But he was bleeding from the mouth. But Lundy came in and pushed Kieran O'Leary down on top of him, which which hurt him way more than what Payne did. And I think that was it. It's it's difficult enough. They were going to get hammered regardless of whether he got sent off or not. He <laughs> yeah. was marking Ian Burke, and then Fionn Fitzgerald had to go over. They were being hammered anyways against the wind, so yeah. it, it had no bearing on the game. I, from the replay I saw, he didn't make contact with his face. It was it kind of in the chest. Uh, maybe if you kick up like that, you're giving yourself the red card. Your I don't studs know. Studs as well. I, I don't with know. the studs, yeah. Maybe it was dangerous because even if it didn't catch him in the face, which I don't think it did, it's still dangerous to do that, anyways. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely would have sent him off. I thought it was stupid as well. He got it free, like you know. And I know, yeah, you see for the people, captain, he was captain. Yeah. Like he, he and Mark do. and Ian Burke, such an important job. Yeah, like, you know. I don't know, it was, it was unnecessary, and I, it was just very dangerous. When I see studs going up towards somebody like that, I think you just sort of get what you deserve. Yeah, maybe you're right. Lundy gave the match officials three cheers. Did you hear that in his speech? <laughs> like, I mean, I've never heard match <laughs> officials to get such a... Three cheers are, is reserved for the losers, and everybody hates that three cheers anyways. Like, it means yeah. nothing. You're down, I've lost finals, and you're given a three cheers, and it's just like, oh, this is... I, I prefer <laughs> not to have any attention be drawn to us. We're just going to show respect, stay out in the field. Yeah. Just don't mention us. Yeah, because everyone Everyone looks at you yeah, then, yeah, like, yeah. and you're all standing. And, and the TV <laughs> cameras all pan down as you're like just looking at the ground, yeah. and you're and you're getting a token three cheers from the captain, who might be even smiling when he's doing yeah. it. And I hate that tradition, I really do. But Lundy gave it to the match officials, so like I mean, I think Lundy might have given it to the match officials because he gave Gucci right punch into the face. Now he'll say he was tackling the ball, but he still he still burst. Lundy was aggressive. And he was out around midfield, and that's a new role from him. When he when the destroyed slot nail, he was full forward. He was the linchpin of the forward line, and they've evolved now. Martin Farraher is the is the new man in there with Ian Burke, and Lundy's given a, a real working role, and he's aggressive, and he was really in and 
uh, it was Leonard, Mark, Gavin, White. We were wondering about our matchups yeah. last week, but Lundy was definitely um, all over the field. And you were saying in the second half, I didn't notice this on television, that when they had the spare man, Lundy ended up, uh, yeah. they wriggled around for Lundy to be the spare man. So it wasn't, you know, the, the obviously the, the old tradition in GE is if you have an extra man, a man sent off, he immediately goes in as the sweeper. Yeah. And the cornerback, just pick, you know, even though he's not a good player, he just becomes a spare man. I but, um, hate that. <laughs> I don't, it always amazed me. Yeah. The it boy who doesn't want the balls, a spare man. Yeah. <laughs> like, use the spare man to go into an attacking position that the opposition, not only do have a man sent off, they're now going to have to take off a forward to bring on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, so that you're doubly screwing them yeah. by actually leaving the spare man up front. No, it was, it was really well done. And because Crooks were going for it as well, Crooks couldn't really sort of adjust to try and watch Lundy because they wanted to keep men forward. And right. Yeah, like he did it really well. The legs on him, he was getting back when they needed an extra man back. But then he was like he was a free man then going forward. And it meant for the kickouts, for Crook's kickouts, they had an extra man pushed up. So they were really squeezing them in. Right. Bit of a wind coming in off the hill. So that's why it was so just like a foregone conclusion for Crook's in the second half. Couldn't get out. And it was just all like, all Cora Finn. Like, yeah. yeah, outstanding stuff from Cora Finn. I wouldn't be, you'd be brave enough to back against them doing three in a row, although it's it's going to be a difficult one for them to do. Like, you you'd, you'd just imagine they probably got their hardest games this year in Galway in the county final. They needed yeah. a replay. Now, very defensive um, display that day. But at the same time, Galway club football must be in pretty pretty good um, health because the, the county team are doing pretty well. They've had a they've had a great league they're after beating Ross Common at the weekend. It was interesting to read Kevin Walsh a comment after beating Ross Common. So Galway are getting a bit of bad press and like we're probably agreeing that when you see what Tyrone could do to Dublin and then you see the forwards that Galway have and you'd be like pulling your hair out saying, Jesus lads, you've got the tools to really hurt this to hurt these teams. I'm not sure if they're using it. Now in their defence they haven't had their full complement and they've been really really experimental in this league so for them to be on eight points with the amount of players they've been down yeah. no Cara Finn lads it shouldn't be taken away from Galway how they're performing to that level and beating the teams that they're doing but it was interesting Kevin Walsh was responding to the criticism that they're receiving at inter-county level and he says to be honest I don't really I don't really overly care about what's being said our lads are very happy in what we're doing and what and we're working very hard at the end of the day people want results and we're going to try and give them as many results as we can to Galway. So I think that was a, a really interesting one after the Cora Finn one. Cora Finn fans want results and they get results as well. <laughs> yeah. It seems to be that the perception, defensive managers seem to put this perception out there and it's the same with Fermanagh and, and, and Carlo. Any of these ones that are the more extreme ones, this is the only way we can get results. Where's the evidence that you've tried something else? You know what I mean? Where's the evidence that this management team and like, I don't want to get bogged down in that conversation. I just thought it yeah. was interesting. Uh, coming the, the day before Cora Finn got an All-Ireland result yeah. playing scintillating football. Kevin Walsh is talking about having to do that to get results himself. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I thought that was um, an interesting one. But anyways, we won't get, get too bogged down in that because um, Dublin are out of the league final. That's probably the big headline coming from the inter-county um, uh, season and we're going to talk about Tyrone a little bit in part two but I'm not sure whether this should be reading too much into being out of the league now it is interesting that it's the only time under Jim Gavin they haven't made the league they're going for five in a row so the perception out there is that Dublin don't care about this league and they're really only focused on a championship I think that's bullshit yeah Jim Gavin, like it was like he was after sucking on a lemon in his interview afterwards he I was livid like that, yeah. he was livid and he was like, this isn't good enough. It's very out of character mm. performance from to Dublin. Play for Dublin we are not used to that. We are not used to that. And I don't know, like, could it be that the pressure of this year, uh, could it be that while Jim Gavin is telling them we want to win every game, players themselves are more focused on the championship and they're maybe in their own head say, Jesus, well, one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to be injured for this five in a row or I don't want to, you know, that... Yeah. I, there's no way Jim Gavin is saying to them lads this is our own focus because what's worked for them every other year has been to to win the league yeah. and then win the championship because we know that uh, realistically Leinster is a joke for, for Dublin so they're not getting the quality games against the top teams until all are in quarter final super 8 so they need that league final you know they, yeah. they just want it and especially in the early rounds of the league you don't know who's trying what so the league final is one huge championship level game that Dublin really need 
based on the fact that they won't have another one until August. Yeah, like that that, that idea that they're they're focusing on the championship. They, it's nonsense. If they were focusing on the championship the last four years and they yeah. got to the league final. Like you know, it wasn't like they weren't prioritizing championship. They were still going for the All Ireland, and this is what happened. And Jim Gavin's never lost three games in a year. You know, again, like they're not doing something differently and saying let's focus. They, they keep winning the championship. Yeah. Like, you know, so why would they change that? So this is like you know, like they might they're still favourites to win the championship, obviously, but. Like, you know, this is a, a wobble. Like, this is worst form than they've ever had under Jim Gavin. Like, they are in their worst period of form. They've, they've lost three out of six. Yeah. They're losing every other game. Like, that's an, against Division One opposition who are good, great, but Dublin usually just swat these boys aside. They have been. They've been winning at the reason. They've been winning even when they haven't been playing well, that well. And the most striking thing was when Sludden got sent off, which was a joke of a black card, by the way. Like, I mean, wha- at what point was it uh, O'Connor... Uh, Keen O'Connor maybe who is who he's wrestling with and the two of them were at it and then he just falls down and slow. that's not a black card that's not what the black card is in yeah. for like I mean it's a pro- slight foul or even if it was a foul but it's nonsense but there was no comeback there was no backs to the wall by Tyrone it was bizarre like Tyrone were at their ease with 14 men in Crow Park against yeah. Dublin that's worrying for, for Dublin like what is going on uh, mentally with them is yeah. wh- is what I would be wondering because we were raving about them against Kerry because you know they came back and you were saying about what great champions they are and yeah. they're never beaten but they did seem beaten in this game like it was the first time that you seemed to have them with 10 minutes to go even with 14 men Dublin always even when they're going down they swing out at you and they use a the score yeah. from it but like they had one shot from about 18 yards out and it was blocked and and that was it really like Tyrone were two points there were two points in it when they went to man down yeah. 20 minutes to go went out 24 to four, yeah. Went out to four. Yeah. So Kieran Shannon tweeted, um, might prove not to be significant, the dubs not making the league final, but the last drive for five bid we've seen in senior GEA, Kilkenny 2010, Kilkenny failed to make the playoff stages for the league for the first time that spring. So in 08, they topped the, the league in, um, or they were table toppers and semi-finalists versus tip. They were league finalists then in 06, 07 and 09. So, like, I mean, they got caught, obviously, by Tipperary. Now, the difference between the Kilkenny drive for five and the Dublin drive for five is that Tipperary almost beat Kilkenny for the four. So Kilkenny were going for five in a row, knowing that this Tipperary was a really coming team under Liam Sheedy. And, you know what I mean? While they were favourites to beat them in the final, I don't see a team having done that last year to Dublin. You know what I mean? A team needs to come out of nowhere, really, to be other than Mayo. But, you know, like, I mean... Yeah, I'm not sure Mayo can beat Dublin in all the <laughs> final. If I'm being honest, <laughs> there's still a bigger gap from Dublin to everybody else than there was from Kilkenny. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Now Kerry, maybe the '82 Kerry uh, one was a better one, like because they were unbeatable that year and they couldn't do it. So I've said this before. We speculated here. What? Like, remember uh, it was uh, Sheedy. Um, who said that it's just his nerves he missed the penalty oh, yeah. M- Mikey Sheedy missed the penalty in the final and just went he felt weighed down yeah and felt like he had concrete in his boots or something she- is that what like, it was yeah, that we were joking about all this like I mean <laughs> the, imagine the pressure they're under but like I mean this is serious pressure this is a five in a row unprecedented never happened before this is Dublin the big glamour team all the pressure that Dublin are under anyway to perform because they're the highest profile team and this is just adding to it like I said, we don't, we won't know until the year is out. Yeah, That's definitely. The only thing is, like, they, they've only won three games, but they still have the best score difference in the league. So when they turn up, they're still by far the best team in the country. Like yeah. they was just, ah, they, they will turn yeah. up all they beat, the time. They beat Cat or the beat, uh, the Galway well in Crow Park, which Galway didn't really show up. The mo- the only other thing, because we said we'll mention this game in part two, is the Niall Morgan hit on Paddy Andrews. It was a little bit sickening to watch. Now, my analysis of this is if you get an opportunity to take Paddy Andrews out on the blind side like that, 95% of players would take it. Like the, the whole risk of going for a ball that you can't quite know where your bearings are is the, the chance that you could be taken out. And brave players always go for that. Now, they're taking him out legally and they're taking him out illegally. Now, we're not going to speculate on whether Niall Morgan tried to knock him out, basically, but you are fully entitled and you'd be a bit of an idiot really if you have a chance to blindside hit a lad rattle him with a shoulder let him rattle him so hard with a shoulder that he has to leave the pitch better still I'd yeah. do it myself no problem the, f- the point of the matter is that Niall Morgan mistimed his tackle and caught him straight into the face intentional or not I don't care that's what he did you know so it's a sending off it's an absolute blatant red card he came across recklessly his intentions was to completely take Paddy Andrews out whether illegally, 
or legally. We'll say whether what what he wanted to do, we don't know. But he took him out illegally because he didn't chal- didn't time the challenge right. So it's a clear clear red card, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Yeah, like I, I think there's a red card. I actually would have a bit of sympathy for him, like obviously for Andrews as well, but for Morgan and that, I, I don't think he was going... Like, that happens in every yeah. single game. See, like I that. don't care if you want to do him or not. Yeah, no. like, I mean, every player will try to rattle the shit out of him in that situation. Yeah, exactly. You're going to try and yeah. take him out legally. But the fact of the matter is, he didn't time it and he took him out illegally. Yeah. So it's a clear it's No, a clear yeah, red. and I agree. I, but I just, like, there's a... Like, people call him, like, like, Joe Brawley was saying, Morgan's a pup, he's been at this stuff before, but... In that situation, that's a that's a cultural thing. Like the ball's there, and it's like it's perfectly timed, and you can clatter into a player, and you just throw your body into him. Like, and that happens all yeah. over the country. And in you, every game. If, if you were, if you were a manager and you said you had a chance to take him out and you didn't take exactly, him, you wouldn't yeah. be even why happy. You, why with are you it? pulling out of that? Why would you not? <laughs> yeah. Jesus, hit him! Yeah, and lay down a marker and all these things. But again, so Niall Morgan did the right thing by trying to take him out. He's just he did it legally instead of legally. Isn't that fair enough? Yeah, I think so. And he's also a keeper, <laughs> so he's so far away from his goals. He has to do something. He can't just stand them up now and start tackling them. He has to end that play. Yeah. With a free or whatever it is, like you know. Yeah, because you often you tell say it to goalkeepers as well, and you know a long ball's coming in and they get applauded for this, and a fella could be just going up to to catch it or punch it, and the goalie comes out takes man and ball, ball and, man, yeah. and you're encouraged to do that and if your goalkeepers are not able to do that he's not a very good goalie so <laughs> yeah. that's a that's applauded you know what I mean so I, I don't know like I mean it's, it, he should have got a red and it was a bit sickening to see Paddy Andrews fall the way he did yeah, you know what I mean he was clearly yeah. knocked out so how a referee would see that and go that wasn't a red it was just a bizarre a bizarre decision so anyways that was the game of the night because I, I started watching Mayo Kerry thinking this was going to be a great game and it was on our mad Donegal levels of oh, of wind and rain. So it turned out that it was a shite uh, game, really. And the players aren't at fault for this. It just ended up being a battle. Yeah. You could read feck all into it. It was just a terrible night for football. Um, having said that, there are a lot of people are reading stuff into it, even though you couldn't possibly read anything into it. Because, like, I mean, Kerry weren't at the pitch of the game. Mayo were. Obviously, May are coming off two losses. Kerry were breezed into a final. You'll say yeah. that straight away. So there was the pitch. Mayo hitting them hard, going 3 nil up against the wind. Kerry were asleep. Kerry looked like they sh- didn't respect Mayo, if I'm being honest. Um, and uh, that was basically it. So, like, I mean, last night I saw it on League Sunday and suddenly now Mayo are back. Because, and the, 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 the analysis after the Dublin game, Mayo are shite. Mayo are gone. Yeah. Now Aidan O'Shea is great. Playing a centre forward, you, you've started midfield, you're brilliant, this is your position. You play at centre forward, but play in midfield, yeah. that's not your Like, it's just a lot. <laughs> it, like, I mean, I'd even had Aidan O'Rourke, who's usually smart, um, and the RT website, he was writing Kerry off for not having any defensive game plan when, like, only two games ago against Dublin, Kerry clearly showed that they're working on their defensive game plan, and... Like they did really well against the Dublin team, and they manned up to them, and they got bodies yeah. back, and they got tackles in, and last n- or Saturday night they didn't. So one game can't be that they're all fixed, and another game can't be that they've no defensive plan. I don't get. Wh- this is the frustrating thing about the league. You don't know where teams are at, or how they care about it, or like you don't know what they did during the day or during the week. So you can't read into it. You take yeah. the game kind of as it was. And you can talk about talking points and what teams are trying to do, but you actually can't come to conclusions in fecking, what are we in, the middle of March? March. It's nonsense. Mayo, that, I'd write off that game. It was a messy night. It turned into a battle that Mayo wanted to win it more. And that was basically the story of that game. Is the whole thing about Kerry as well, like over the last five games before the Mayo game, like they have been like really smart and defensive and aggressive. And but it's, the, it's, the, it's that need for... Final conclusions, yeah, out of all every the time, game, out of yeah. every game. Yeah, so we have gone from shit to good, and yeah, Kerry have gone from class back to again. You know, yeah. and like you, instead of against Mayo at Dublin and Croke Park, you couldn't just so, geez, Mayo are awful. Yeah, why does it have to be Mayo are finished and they won't win it all? Early? Like, why does that conclusion always have to be drawn instead of just going, Jesus, they were awful, they were terrible against Dublin, they had no clue what they were doing. Now they were brilliant against their own. Yeah. Like I mean, there's such inconsistencies because. Behind the scenes, none of us know what they're doing in training. You know, what they're focusing on. What They're picking teams and they're making four changes before the start. They're giving lads uh, uh, runs in different positions. You can't draw conclusions on any of this. Unfortunately, the league in Division 1 is a warm-up competition. 
pretty much for the top teams. Division t- three, 2, 3 and 4, you can conclude more into those because these teams really want to get up and get promoted. The problem is we don't feckin' see any of those, <laughs> those games on television. <laughs> Isn't it hilarious? Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, and just on Kerry, like, they, they've gone to Galway and got a massive result, you know, just slugged it out. They've beaten Tyrone, Monaghan, gone to Cavan. Like, they have been... Very harsh to really criticise yeah. Kerry after that poor performance against Mayo. Like, I mean... And, and also, it was a really a, just a poor twi- first 15, 20 minutes which had them chasing their tails then. And the state of the weather, like, yeah, the ball that Tommy Walsh was never on that no. night, whereas the, the week before, that was the big thing we were talking about. Look at Tommy Walsh, you're going to use yeah. him in the summer. And then yeah. she couldn't play one ball with him because if you put it up in there, God knows where it was going. Yeah, so just awful uh, conditions altogether. So Cavan are practically down. Like, there's nothing really... Um, that can save Cavan they have a home match to Dublin so they have to beat Dublin at home and they have to hope for a three way tie so they have to hope that Monaghan um, Monaghan lose to Mayo and they have to hope that Ross Common draw with Kerry and then they'd all be, they would all be on four points and then Cavan have a better score difference so that's not going to happen so they're straight back down um, Cavan are not a Division 1 team they don't have a Division 1 forward line there's no point in saying anything else they just don't and they'll always go up and come straight back down um, unfortunately for them um, the Jack McCarran sending off that was a very I don't think it can be even overestimated how filthy that tackle was I think that should have been a straight red um, a, we got a second yellow and Malachi Roke actually got sent off which is very unlike him um, I think it was from maybe complaining about this but it was around that incident it mm. didn't show it last night in the highlights but if a lad's running past you with his body open and you just punch him straight into the ribs that's a closed fist punch it's the same as a punch in the face it's a straight red card and McCarran's uh, fond of that yeah. kind of thing he is like, yeah, I was just going to say that he has like we're talking about Morgan being a pup but like he actually has a bit of previous in that as yeah. well and I, 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 I honestly think that's so cowardly. Like, you it know, is. I think what it's Paddy cowardly. Andrews did is manly. Paddy Andrews went for a ball not knowing what would happen to him. He got the ball. Yeah. Do you mean Jack McCarran pointing someone who's running up the pitch? When, you're, when your rib cage is open, it's a, it's a dirty, dirty thing to do. And you, you, like you're, you're not protected. You're meant to tackle the ball. And you're just... You see, you see some players doing it. It's, it's a filthy thing to do. It was a straight red. And I hope Malik O'Rourke wasn't complaining about the second yellow because, like, I mean, it's the, at the minimum a yellow card. Yeah, maybe he just didn't see what had happened. I, I don't know. I like to think that in a way. But I think when they w- watch back, they'll be like, ah, right, yeah, we've gotten the wrong here. But, like, we talk, we talk about this whole thing. Like, what is, what is brave about pointing somebody who's playing football? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you know? Yeah, no, definitely not. So is that, that's another straight red. So there should have been those two straight reds from, from what we've seen. It should have been straight reds from what we've seen. Big news from Division 2 is that Mead are up. I owe Mead an apology. I tipped them to go down. So, so, like, I. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so the first time since 2006. So it's going to take a huge turn of events for Mead not to uh, go up. They have a plus 15 score difference. The next best is Donegal and plus 5. And Fermanagh, the Black Death, are on plus 2, which is uh, not too surprising. Um, so Ma- Andy McEntee, just from the report of this, we didn't see anything of this. They had six shots on goal inside the first six minutes. Talk about going for teams. Like, I mean, that's s- some serious kind of stuff. Now, they had a strong win, but they're really, like Keen said, it was the same against Armagh, um, that they're really, when they have a win, they're just pinning the, te- pinning the opposition in and they're really, really going for them with an, uh, with an aggressive press. So six shots on goal inside the first six minutes. That's some, some going. But Clare were rallied and were well in it at half time, And it was a Graham Riley goal who just looks like he's going to be a super sub. Um, this year he got a goal to put four in it so that's it so they're two points clear of Fermanagh so Donegal are their second so what the only way that uh, Mead won't go up is if they is if Donegal win uh, Fermanagh beat them and uh, Fermanagh will beat them on the head to head and if Donegal have to beat Kildare have to make up a 10 point score difference on Mead against Kildare basically so Mead are true so congratulations to Mm. Mead they're that's a that's a great achievement from them, especially after last year, third from bottom, I think they were, and losing to Longford in the league. So whatever Andy McEntee's doing this year, unfortunately we haven't seen them yet. But Keane Keen doesn't really rave about them. Maybe he's doing uh, he the old cute doing. tour, yeah. keep keeping expectations <laughs> down. But like I have Keane come in here and I'm like, Jesus me, tell me, he says, Ah, they were all right. You know, they were 
<laughs> it's in it all year. Yeah, he's not really selling them to me too much. Yeah, I'm just thinking if uh, Fermanagh are planning on scoring six points again as well, me should be all right. Like they don't hold them to to six points. No, me will run right against them. You'd imagine, you'd imagine me should be able to beat uh, Fermanagh even in the last game. So like I mean, and that and the Donegal aren't guaranteed even to beat Kildare because Kildare have an outside chance. That Division Two is great. Kildare, if Kildare beat Donegal, they go above them, and obviously if Mead beat Fermanagh which are not too crazy sequence of events. Then you've got Mead and Kildare going up and we've got Leinster football is back in the big time, yeah. baby. <laughs> Dublin, Mead and Kildare <laughs> up, in, up in Division 1, the much maligned Leinster Championship. Um, yeah, so that's it. Cork look to be relegated. So they're away to Armagh, which you'd imagine they won't even win that. But what they need to do if they beat Armagh, they need Tipperary to beat Clare. Um, yeah, if, if Tipperary beat Clare then Armagh or then Cork and Tipperary would be on the same points on five and Cork have beaten Tip so they could potentially stay up if they do their side of the draw you might fancy Tip to beat Clare and then amazingly uh, Tip and Clare go down so <laughs> there's a there's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of you know suspense about what's going to happen in that division three I was thinking Cork are gone but they're not gone at all because that is not the most unlikely sequence of events. The Cork were five points up against uh, Donegal at half time, so it was a game of two halves. They ended up losing by seven, a twelve point uh, second half turnaround. Darrow Boyle um, and Neil McGee both came on, so the Guidor lads are back in the mix. So Boyle scored two points, so there might be a role for him, uh, maybe as one of those working wing forwards. I think maybe midfield is might be sewn up with McGee and McFadden, but a Boyle could play midfield either, I suppose. Yeah, like uh, like they've got a lot of like, sort of big players now around there. Um, that's that's really great to see because he obviously hasn't featured that much for Donegal. Like, and now, yeah. like we've seen how great he is for Guido, and yeah. it's like Jesus, like he's a, he's a racehorse. So we could play wing forward easily. Carry on, carry over that, uh, carry over that kind of confidence from the club, and you know, do do well. Division three is very interesting because there's a whole lot of teams: Downleash, Westmead, and Loud. Um, and I think Longford have an outside chance of, of uh, getting promoted. So, like, I mean, it's unreal. And at the bottom, you have Offaly and Carlo, who look like one of the two of them will be gone down with Sligo. So Offaly, Offaly, play, play, Sligo, Offaly play Sligo and Carlo play Leash. And obviously Offaly beat Sligo. This was one of the permutations I was talking about last yeah. Thursday. And Leash beat Carlo. Carlo go down on the head-to-head with Offaly. So, like, I mean, <laughs> and, and that's... Uh, Carlo would be very unlucky because in my head, Offaly have been a lot less impressive than Carlo in Division yeah. 3 and could actually pip them. Um, pip them. But what's going to mess this division up is that, obviously, Westmead and Loud was postponed. Um, Mead and Clare was postponed as well. And that was refixed to the very next day, wasn't it? That yeah. was refixed until the Sunday. Um, Westmead and Loud so Drogheda was unplayable like are you telling me obviously it's not fair for pl- on players to say right well it's off on Saturday but now your bank holiday Monday is gone <laughs> yeah. so I would maybe say it's fair enough that but when are they go- they're going to have to play this in midweek or else the le- either the league three final is played the first weekend in April which is not what they want and obviously because Westmead are in the hunt for promotion they can't just write off around like they did last year so it's you know what I mean they're completely screwed and what happened the Irish weather in March. <laughs> Deja vu. Who, who predicted this? Us. Who predicted <laughs> it last year? Us. Yeah. So, like, they made no tweaks at all to this time of the year. And in fact, <laughs> like we mentioned last Thursday, there now there's officials who are completely detached to the reality for players. Are even talking about moving the under twenty into this area, right? <laughs> like, <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that this is a real mess. So Westmead and Loud might have to play um, this Wednesday night. There's been no word as of when we started recording as, as to when this is on Westmead are favourites probably to go up with down if Westmead beat Loud and win their last game they go up there's nothing Leash can do about that mm. the GA need to hope that they can play midweek even though it's unfair on players but like they've left themselves again with no room for error and then it's just like you know one week of bad weather everything gets knocked back and it gets into April and then we all start complaining about April for clubs and you know the exact same thing that happened in 2018 so yeah they may hope that they can get a plate on Tuesday or Wednesday night yeah. Which isn't fair on the players, but sure, who cares about the players? The big talking point from Division 4 is Derry uh, beat Leitrim pretty well, seven points in the end. We might talk a little bit about um, Derry in performance of the weekend. So that's that. There's no, nothing really else, but Division 4 is just boring because the two of those teams are up. Um, anyway, last story here before we go into part two is one that caught my eye. Colin Kelly, who's been on the show a couple of times, obviously managed loud, got them out of Division 4 and Division 3. Um, then went to manage Westmead only lasted a year with Westmead 
Um, then he went back. He's just managing some intermediate team in Loud now. But he wanted an interview for the Loud under 20, under 20 job and he didn't get an interview. Now, I'd be completely on his side on this. I don't know what went on behind the scenes in Loud, but how a manager of Colin Kelly's calibre, who is an interest in your under 20s, that's a joke, an ex-player that he would not get an interview for that job. So there's something, there's politics going on there in some way because on the surface of it, it looks completely wrong that a county board wouldn't give him an interview at yeah. the very least. So now he's after joining the Wexford backroom team. Um, and Wexford, who do Wexford play in the first round of the championship on the 12th of May Don't in tell Wexford me. Park? Loud. So how has this come <laughs> about? Like, I mean, this is hilarious. This is kind of Colin Kelly maybe just being very, very annoyed. Did he reach out to, to, to Wexford? Did Wexford hear that this interview hadn't been granted and, and approached him? It's just a bizarre turn of yeah. events that he'd end up uh, with Wexford who play loud almost. It looks... Listen, if you're putting two and two together, you hear somebody that's been scorned and he's getting revenge. Yeah. Like, I think you need to rise above that revenge when it comes to your own county. Your own Although county, I, yeah. I, have, I have thought of this revenge yeah. mission. <laughs> uh, like when I got burned from Port Leash that time, I had thought about joining another club in Leash and going, you know, up yours. And Really? But then you have to think, yeah. oh, come on. Like, I mean, you have to... Those revenge thoughts, and I would be a very vengeful person. <laughs> But you have to tr- you have to fight against that, like and go. Wait, do you'll regret this. This is knee jerk. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, sleep on it for a S- night or two. Well, even yeah, sleep on it for six months and yeah. calm down. <laughs> yeah, in your case, six months. <laughs> <laughs> I think I needed six months maybe to calm down. But yeah, I think he's making a mistake. You know, if that if that if they were his intentions. Now we've got things wrong with Colin Kelly, and he's pulled me up in the show before about this. <laughs> um, so I'm sure he might be contacting me um, when he listens to this, that because he told me the last time. It was about the Westmead players. He was bringing in players onto the panel eight. And I said, I can't understand how managers do this. This door opened. They miss all the stuff. But they lost a lot of players and yeah. he needed to build it up for training. And he told me, anytime you've got any problem with anything or wondering stuff, what I'm doing, just ring me and find out. So I haven't <laughs> rang him and I'm, and, <laughs> and I'm back speculating again. So I could be expecting a text message from Colin here. Yeah, that's like I, I, it's weird going against your own county anyway. But then in no circumstances, no, I think it's more weird that Lloyd wouldn't even. Gee, this boy might be worth chatting to if he yeah. wants to come into our underage setup and help yeah. out there. Like, but I um, agree, I agree. Colin, get in contact if, yeah. I've got, if I've got this wrong, which I could have. Right, we'll be back with part two. So Tyrone one fourteen, Dublin one eleven. So this was just a fantastic performance from Tyrone, and this is. Tyrone pretty much doing, like, again, I don't want to sound cocky and blow our own trumpets, but this is Tyrone doing what we've been trying to preach, me, you, and Keen Ward, on this show for how long? That Dublin's, one of their great strengths is always one of their weaknesses, is that they're so aggressive and they push up everywhere that a long early ball will give you a two-on-two or a one-on-one. Leash proved it last year in the Leinster final. They were the only team we said loads of times that came with an obvious attacking plan where they wanted to run the ball and give in good long ball. Leash might not have had the quality that day and they didn't have the support up to them. There also wasn't an attacking mark b- back then, <laughs> which, you know, might have suited Evan O'Carroll or Donny Kingston a couple of times. Dublin were able to go back and double up, you know, double up. Dublin will cop on pretty quick to this, but the offensive mark obviously gives you the weapon that a sweeper's no good with that kind of ball coming in because once it's won, your sweeper can't double up. But all those things aside... Tyrone are clearly, clearly, the penny has dropped with Mickey Hart. Now, he's been stubborn for a long, long time. And we've been pleading with Tyrone to mix up their game. And they flirted with it last year a little bit. It was more with Richie Donnelly in there. Now they've Maddie Donnelly in there and they've Cahill McShane in there. And they have two big men who can win their own ball and score. And that's double trouble for bloody Dublin because we've said it before. Dublin might have one lad in there that can handle a big, big man that can score. Mm. Johnny Cooper doesn't look like he likes that that type of ball. Doesn't look like he likes marking that type of fella. He likes to get out in front of you. So, all in all, it's hugely positive from Tyrone. Hugely, hugely positive. And Mickey Hart has finally realised that having variety to your attack <laughs> is better than just having one attacking <laughs> game plan, which just seems so like. 
some of the things we say here like seem so logical and then you're wondering why the hell did that take Mickey Hart who's a brilliant manager yeah. this long to figure this out yeah who, who has like sort of orchestrated some of the most amazing attacks that we've yeah. seen down through the years and I actually thought it was it was mad looking at him afterwards and he was so like he was grabbing McShane and Donnelly and it was like we, we did it like you know I didn't see this coming but um you, god you actually are good enough like yeah. and because McShane and Donnelly are they're big men, but they're quality footballers. Yeah. And like Richie Donnelly, he actually had a good game out around the middle, but that was the difference. He was winning ball up there and not really like you know, doing much of it. Whereas when Donnelly got it, Matty Donnelly got the ball there on Saturday night, turning straight away and swinging it over and always on the run. Yeah. And, Mc and McShane's needed an identity. I think McShane's always gone along. What is he? Mm. He's not good enough for a midfielder. He's not able for that kind of level. Is he a forward? What I'm always wondering, McShane, what is he? That's what he is. Yeah. He's a big man who can win his own ball and he can score. And he's not been used in that position. Like, I mean, like it's, 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 it's actually hilarious talking about, like when you talk about Mickey Hart, they've been going with Mark Bradley, they've been going with Lee Brennan, they've been going with um, McCurry. McCurry. <laughs> going with all these players. Isn't it amazing? Well, you've McShane, who can put in a performance like that and have put in a finish like that on mm. Cluxton, and this fellow's been out floating around the midfield and uh, still kind of thinking is this lad even a top quality is he a quality inter-county player what is this lad really yeah. what's his what's his selling point to me like I've always been like this with McShane but now you can see that there is a real player there if, if he's used correctly yeah it was but yeah it was just one of the lads before one of the boys running up the pitch and he looked like he had a bit of muscle he did, and he never had that pace to break a pace and he never really had the, like I said he's not able for a Fenton or a proper midfielder mm. so he was always like He's an all I ever thought he was is an option for a kick out from Morgan out on a wing. That's all I ever <laughs> yeah. thought he was. Like. <laughs> but now, like he, him in there is making everybody else look better. Look at that ball Hamsey played on the right, the outside of the boot, like diagonal ball, like you know, across the other side, and McShane wins the mark, and you know, suddenly you're like, Jesus, yeah, that's a great ball from Hamsey because now that option's on. Where it never was before, it was Mark Bradley having three men cover his mouth, you know, keep yeah. him down. But now I'd say that one of the Bradleys. Or or Anne McCurry would still win that ball because it was just the quality of that ball was just out of yeah. this world. Like, and I mean, Hamsey gave that. Would Hamsey wouldn't have given it probably if one of them were in there. Although, like, I mean, if you give if the diagonal ball is good enough, it doesn't matter what size you are, you'll probably win it because you're yeah. trick, you're tricking the back anyway. And I suppose the system then is the most important thing there. The system's more important. Like the system is we're running it, and these little small lads are looping around us. That was the system. Yeah. This system's completely different now. They're being encouraged. But Mickey Hart was interviewed on the pitch after the match and uh, after the match at some point, I think, and he said, "Long kick passes don't come naturally to our players." So this is kind of maybe given a reason why they didn't do it. On the evidence of Hamsey's ball, of the evidence of of Frank Bur of of Burns, um, some of his passes, mm -hmm. Niall Sludden, little tasty little dinky diagonal balls that Curra Finn gave. I didn't see much evidence that they didn't come naturally to these lads. It just wasn't. It wasn't focused on. Any team, any team can give. Like good ball in. These are inter county players. These are top level players. They can all kick off the inside of the boot. They can most of them kick off the outside of the boot. This is Hamsey plays in the full back line, giving that kind of a ball off the outside of the boot. They need to be encouraged to do it. Yeah. They need to be told if that doesn't go to hand. And like Mickey Hart said, when Dublin copped onto it, they didn't. They didn't all work out. But on Tuesday night, with the ones that didn't work out, the fella who gave in the ball that didn't work out is not going to be said. Well, you gave away four percent. The focus is going to change is that we're getting so much change off these balls. I don't care if five, six of them break down. Yep. That was the old Mead philosophy. Get it into Ollie Murphy and Graham Garrity. And if they come out with three of them, well, out of the three we win, we might get 2-1 off it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you have to weigh up what is going to work for you. And that clearly works. And again, I think this is bloody, has been so obvious for so long. And the great thing about this is that it was on television it was analysed last night on League Sunday and I keep saying that managers are copycats. They need to see something in action. Us talking about it is no good. That's just theory. Yeah. They don't deal with theory. They don't deal with what's, what's being, what they're being told to do. They deal with what they can see. Because I think b behind it all, a lot of managers are very basic and they want to see it work before they do it. And I think we'll see a lot more of teams attacking Dublin like this. We saw Kerry doing it in the league. Um, now we're seeing Tyrone. I think Kevin Walsh will absolutely see it. And we're looking at the teams that could potentially beat Dublin 
by doing this. So you're going to mention Tyrone, you're going to mention Donegal. Absolutely Donegal are going to get that in early. Yeah. And they absolutely have players that can really hurt Dublin. And let's put Dublin back on their arses a bit. Because let's exactly, be honest, yeah. Dublin have been at their ease for the last two or three years. Focusing on defensive teams, out-muscling defensive teams, a better running game than... than be- their full back line marking from the front, yeah. destroying teams out in front, and never having their manners put on them by giving a long bloody ball to catch them out by marking from the front. So now Dublin have to scratch their heads and go... Jesus, this has completely taken us. Yeah. Now we have to start focusing on how we're going to deal with this. Yeah, th- this was the first time in six years that Tyrone actually asked Dublin a question. Yes. They've been always trying to answer the questions and w- we've probably been guilty of thinking, oh, maybe Tyrone had the answers for Dublin's questions. But no, like that on Saturday night it was, like, how good is Davy Byrne? How can you cope with this long ball? Yeah. Like, how can you cope with Matty Donnelly? There's a question for you. Like, And then like, are your, are your fullback line good enough? Maybe not. And then... Then Suddenly now Dublin yeah. have to respond Do they bring a sweeper back? That takes away from their aggressive press You get out of defence easier Exactly Just ask them a question Ask them that extra question Do we have to leave our half back line position? Do we need to tell Jack McCaffrey Not to attack so much Because we need to we need to double up We don't. We, we can't just double up Keena Sullivan's doubling up on McShane Who's going to double up on Maddie Donnelly? Jack I need you to be a little yeah. less attacking Suddenly they're screwed and you have a very good point on the... They might need to leave the full-time sweeper there. Mm. They might need to bring a wing forward back if you have enough. Now, Dublin wouldn't do that. But it, again, they have to start talking about this in training. Yeah. Now their game plan is being messed up. How has it taken this long <laughs> to realise? Like, it's just been a culture of fear around Dublin. We can't beat them. We have to contain them. And we have to turn the game into such a, a dog mess that we might get a flick on goal late like Fermanagh against Monaghan last year and we'll beat them that way. Dublin realised that this is all that's coming at us. They constantly worked at it. They got Jason Sherlock in. They did basketball coaching. They did their loops. They don't bring ball into contact. They leave lads outside the screen to always have the out ball. They perfected it. Mm. And they got so comfortable with it. They won an All-Ireland last year without even a glove being on, being landed on them because Mayo were out and Kerry were out. And they're the only teams that might have asked the question of them. And they're the only teams that have come close. Kerry have beaten them and uh, in, the cha- in the league final, which was a very big game. And Mayo have nearly beaten them. And it's taken this long for the other teams to realise it's not because Mayo and Kerry are the two other best teams in the country and, oh, they've got the players to do it. Tyrone have the players to do it. Donegal have. Gal we have. You have to want to do it. You have to decide... Yeah. This is our game plan now. We and again, here's a quote from Mickey. Like I mean, which is hilarious when you when you think about it. If you kick every ball in, then after the first three or four, we were quite successful. Dublin were more conscious of it and cut out a number of them. So again, it's about picking the right time to kick and the right time to run, and a b- about mixing your game up a bit. I suppose we've been known as a running team for a few years now, and we do need to bring a bit of variety to our game. And perhaps this is one way of doing it so basic that isn't it (laughs) that instead of always doing the same thing (laughs) that you might keep make the other team guess and have a a plan Uh, two ways is two ways of hurting a team not better than one like I mean it's that's very obvious but I do think that the important thing here is the variety so Colin McShane and the Donnelly long balls you have to remember that Dublin will get so spooked by that 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 sweeper is going to start drifting back a lot earlier. Maybe one or two. You have two men out the field then. So you absolutely can run a few and use those extra men you have out the field because you'll be pairing up a lot more one-on-one. So those extra men will cause, you know what I mean, better overlaps than when, if you run the ball against Dublin, they're all going to filter back. And by the time you know what Dublin have 13 and you're always saying, well, Dublin are a defensive team. No, they only are again. How come Dublin didn't have 13 back when these lovely balls were being peppered in? They were completely exposed because Dublin filter back. They don't go back before the ball. And there you go. Like it's very <laughs> yeah. basic analysis, isn't it? And like yeah, and they've, they've been playing the same way like you said and like for the last few years the terms of engagement except against Mayo have always been set by Dublin. It's always been on Dublin's terms like and yeah. like, so they know how the team's going to set up. They're all going to be behind the ball. Dublin know how to work around it. And then when the team rarely turn it over or win a kick out Dublin know how to defend that they all track back and they, and they get in the position and they know how to block off those spaces yeah. and if they, you're trying to hand pass around them yeah and you have two players see I don't never agreed with Peter Hart in that full forward line even though he was I've always said there's a brilliant role for Peter Hart and Niall Sludden imagine marking them uh, around the half forward line between the half forward line and midfield and that's their that's their area 
and seeing Sludden being able to pick up ball past the halfway mm. line and giving diagonal ball into Donnelly and actually for one of Donnelly's balls after Sludden's given that diagonal ball Hart's gone off him yeah. he didn't use him and one Donnelly knocks it down to Hams or to McShane it just looked like like this is beautiful yeah this is leaving Donnelly this is leaving McShane and then Sludden and Hart playing off them what a four what a four yeah. that's dangerous that's very 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 dangerous and this is a completely different Tyrone team by doing this yeah I think that comment from Mickey Hart about like their kick passing not being natural like that'd be hard to swallow as a Tyrone person because like they've always been the most naturally talented Ulster team anyway at football yeah you know, it's always come so easy to him and they have a lot of fantastic players there so I think I, I don't know was that him just sort of saving face from the last couple of years maybe but they have some beautiful players well, there. It's, it's, listen it's always what you're coached what are you encouraged to do you look I always say you look at Everton under David Moyes, right? So there would have been a typically British style, get the ball down, play wingers, play the wing. Yeah. Then Roberto Martinez takes them over. So there's a lot of managers who said Everton players can't play that Barcelona possession style game. Roberto Martinez had them just completely dominating possession against teams. This is Everton, not a top team. He encouraged them. They're professional footballers. Of course they can pass the ball and control it. It's what you're encouraging them to do. And you're not having Tyrone now in fear of kick passing a ball away and saying to them, well, you, it's much easier to retain possession through the hands. Now you're encouraging them to, to kick and not, not punishing them for messing up a kick. And look at them flourish. Like they can <laughs> yeah. flourish. These are, inter- these are the top, top level players. And you have to remember the culture of football in Tyrone was not always that culture. Nope. Like the 05 winning team is one of the greatest football teams we've ever seen. Yeah. That's Tyrone. That, and that was always, well, we don't have that quality of players. You don't need that quality of players. You can still play an attacking brand style of football with lesser players and make that effective, you know? You yeah, know? and that's been the culture even before they, they won those All-Irelands. Like, you know, in the 90s, they had a really quality team as well. Like, and that, that culture has been there longer than this sort of defensive counter-attacking yeah. system has been. Yeah, but so they're out of it now, thankfully. They're out of it, so we can stop giving out about them. And <laughs> like I said, the next thing then for the championship which will be really important. And that's the thing that we've been talking about. If that offensive mark isn't there, which it won't be, is Sludden and Hart, get up, get up, get up. I don't want you dropping back too far because these lads are going to need whatever about them playing well together, you know, or whatever does diagonal balls. There are occasions when they're matched up and they're being marked tight where they have to have that option of a hand pass off. And that hand pass off is breaking through the tackle. And that's where Hart and Sludden come in. So, like, leaving those two in next year with a huge gap between them and launching in, hoping for an offensive mark, that might be the case. But in the championship this year, the, the Sludden, it's on you, Sludden and Hart, that if I see these two fellas isolated in there with no options, that's on the two of you. And there's, that's the message to them. So, like, they yeah. know their new roles now. You can work as far as midfield, but you will be marked. So don't bring any more men back. You stay up with yeah. your two men and you give us that option of the offload. So this is great. Um, it's great stuff from Tyrone. Uh, um, it has to be said. Dublin won't be overly, fu- Dublin won't be overly fussed about their, about their performance. But at the same time, they will definitely give, this will definitely give them a cause for concern in that suddenly now, instead of what they've, what they've been working on for the last maybe three years, yeah. might be changing in the year they prib- they would really have liked things just to be a little bit more comfortable than yeah this. it's just bad timing like it's, it's sh- a shock to the system like suddenly they in the five to, in yeah, a row yeah they have to do a different exercise in the gym sort of thing and it's like whoa what what they have been strong and everything else but yeah like they, they still have the best team you know and they probably still unfortunately go on and win they'll earn them but yeah, it's just, it's just have to adapt and they have to adapt quickly. Yeah, exactly. Right, we'll be back with Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend. So Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend and the first one I have to go with Evan O'Carroll. So he scored 1-3. One, one was a free, one was a mark. He got 1-1 one, one from play. I have tweeted out his goal, right? If any of you listening has have not seen this goal, Please, please look at this goal. It's one of the one of the best goals you're likely to see. And this is a ball from Donny Kingston from literally halfway line. Yeah. And it was a bomb of a ball. Now it was a bit of a diagonal on it, but it wasn't. It was one. Of, it was old school. It was like to the bomber listing back in the day. 
and Evan O'Carroll caught a ball out of the clouds. That you, it was just one of the most spectacular catches in that he caught it. He caught the ball way back behind his line of vision. So there's no way, like, for catches, the technique is always keep your eye on the ball. Like playing golf, keep your eye on the ball. Yeah. Playing tennis, you keep your eye on the ball. He couldn't possibly, where he caught the ball, yeah. have been looking at the ball. So this was just a pure instinctive catch. The pace that was on the ball after it coming that far, like to hold on to that in, in the conditions. And then not only that, when he caught it, he's on the edge of the six yard box. His balance is a little bit off because he caught it so spectacularly. To hold his footing, turn around in a split second, realize, shit, I'm in a one on one here and took it just completely neatly into the corner of the goals. My God, that, Conan, that was spectacular now. And this uh, isn't just leash. This yeah. is, it doesn't matter if this was any county doing this. This was beautiful. I saw you tweeting saying, what a goal. And I was like, oh, Jesus, here we go. And all leash loving. And then I saw it and I was like, Jesus Christ. Like yeah. the, the pass was unbelievable. The catch was perfect. Like, you know, it was like a catch I haven't seen before. As you said, it, had, it didn't have his eye on it. But then they go from a 60, 65 yard pass. It was a big boomer catch. And then just this little sort of, Dink oh not, yeah, not a dink, but like just, just well, caressed and a corner, a, a forward that scores a goal like that does not have the skill set to catch a ball like that. Yeah, Do you know what I mean. Now, Donny Kingston has that skill set too. He has that kind of subtlety and that deftness in there as well. But I can only imagine, like, I mean, imagine running towards goals. And me and you always talk about this that Stevie says blasted, and <laughs> I'm, I was never good at scoring goals. I just didn't have that ability. But I know for a fact if I catch a ball in the six yard box. I don't know. I, I, my brain is not able to refocus to to, yeah. to process what I'm meant to do that fast and actually just, you know, taste, tastily took it away into the corner. Yeah. So it's just everything about it was brilliant. Um, obviously, Leash had a very good win um, away to Offaly. It's a local derby and it'll be a local derby against Carlo as well. I thought if they got to 10, they should win it. They should get up. They'd be un very unlucky if they don't. But like, I mean, with Donny Kingston, Evan O'Carroll, Flying a Paul Catalan came on, scored one one. Munley is play Munley is back playing well. Like I mean, Leash definitely have uh, like and um, John O'Loughlin and Kieran Lillis in midfield. Like Leash have a I think Leash are a division two team now. I think that they're doing well. John Sugru, the last time Leash were in division three, they were relegated badly. This time they've got uh they'll probably get ten points, at least eight points. So there's a huge improvement mm. clearly in the two years. They're playing a good brand of football and like you know they're playing football they also have a variety to their attack in that they run some and some they give in long and like i mean when you look at a, a team like leash showing variety to their attacks and then you're looking at the top level teams and we're saying why don't they show variety to their attacks like the, a lot of that credit goes to john sugru yeah i'm a big fan of john sugru i would love to see um leash kill there and meath going at it in a provincial championship without dublin maybe because yeah. i think that'll be real tasty yeah and westmead too like Le Westmead. Leinster, leinster a pretty good province outside of outside of dublin martin Farraher, outstanding um he like i mean he was brilliant last year in the final too like i mean he cleaned up to some of the some of his lovely little points uh from underneath the cusick stand lovely curlers and you almost know by the way he flicks around the outside of it that this, this is curling back in this is yeah. going to be a point just from the technique and obviously he was interviewed on uh, with our own Niall McIntyre and he was talking about being on the Galway panel he said I was, suppose I was in there a few years ago but it didn't really work out for me personally hopefully in the future I might get a call or I might get a chance I was thinking like imagine a player at this level of club football hoping he gets a chance you will get a chance um, Martin like I mean or else Kevin Walsh needs his head red yeah um, Galway have so many different forwards like I mean they, they could field they could field two Intercounty forward lines there outside of Dublin they have the most depth to their to their to their forward line when you see a fella like him <laughs> operating at that level and he's hoping to make the Galway panel <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, we're normally he should be coming and leading the thing now to be crying out to get him back in yeah yeah here's our main man coming yeah. back in it's gas because you're thinking like Silk and Malloy come in has to start straight away Ian Burke has to start straight away I think he shouldn't be far off like you know he's he just has that something else and there's a great there's a great quote from Ian Wright. One time he was talking about George Graham. He used to tell him just to run, make 10 runs across the box uh, during the game. No matter what's happening, just do it because something will happen when you make those runs. And like this is what happens with all the core of in forwards. They all make those runs and then just things happen. Like Everything opens up, boys become free and fire her clips over lovely scores. Yeah, he definitely does it. He can do the loop as well. He likes the loop. Uh, Dahi Burke and Ronan Steed were outstanding in midfield. Dahi Burke got man of the match. I would have given that to him too. 
Um, I thought he was absolutely brilliant. He got forward. He scored, I think he got two points. One of them should have been a goal er early on. That was saved, knocked mm. over the bar. Then he got one in the second half. He put Dotty Casey in his pocket. He, uh, he, that was one of the matchups we actually got right. He, Dottie Casey ended up getting taken off and he's got, he's a real uh, leading force. So it was the midfield battle. You're at, no, like we know Crokes obviously have a very good uh, style of play, but if you can't win primary possession in midfield, if you're bullied in midfield, bullied, yeah. um, and that's it, uh, then Cora Finn, when you, on the flip side, when you're winning midfield, suddenly you're a half forward line are into play a lot, suddenly you're full forward line and yeah. get a lovely ball, and it's just a total, a total different ball game. So bo I'm putting them in as a joint, Steed and Burke. Um, Aidan O'Shea outstanding the other night um, it, again Aidan O'Shea is like the poster boy for Mayo write them off he's back he's terrible he's back Aidan O'Shea is one of the most uh, honest players you'll ever see I've said this constantly you'll always get a shift out of him no he's not the greatest point scorer in the world he's got no confidence anymore now going for points he just turns them down all the yeah. time um, and I'll tell you why it's because he missed one in an all Ireland final against Dublin and suddenly he doesn't have bottle and it's not that he doesn't have bottle he's just not a good point scorer yeah. so now I think Aidan O'Shea has said do you know what I'm, go I'm not even ever going to shoot at the goals because people are putting this down to me not having bottle when it's actually I'm not that good at, at kicking yeah. at kicking points and people were taking too much significance from it as yeah. well when he missed yeah. like, oh they're rattled like they don't have it that's it because <laughs> he's seen as that spiritual leader but to Aidan O'Shea qualities tackling physicality like I mean competitiveness you know fetching all those qualities he's he's a middle third player I still think centre forward's his best position I think he'll absolutely love or be brilliant in midfield we know from Mayo are overloaded with good midfielders and not overloaded with good forwards so Mayo while they might like to play Aiden in midfield they play him centre forward mm. and that's where I would play him for Mayo and he still does the shift out around midfield and the theory behind May him playing centre forward is that the centre back won't follow him midfield and he'll either have a free role in midfield or the centre back will follow him and you're leaving the centre wide open. So yeah. I think the idea that play him centre forward is the right one and he should continue continue on there. But uh Machu Ruan, he's been the real find. He's been he's been excellent. He's briefy as well. Like I mean, Jesus, they have him and the two O'Shea's in around that middle uh yeah. middle of the field. Um, he was brilliant his goal was brilliant it was a brilliant finish similar enough to the Cottle McShane one just show great composure to keep it down and put it down under the goalkeeper yeah. who came diving out it makes the goalkeepers look so bad it does. Motion, doesn't it, it does it's yeah just, they're they, expecting a big blast like, so they're just making themselves big that's it so <laughs> just put it down underneath him but that's it it just takes composure to do that but he's flying it like I mean he's got a great engine out again these type of players with the great engines in these kind of conditions You'd like to see him in Croke Park, but he seems to have plenty. His his engine is very good, and he constantly breaking forward. Mm. Jack Barry won't didn't cover himself in glory. He initially tried to to block down Ruan for his goal early in the move. Didn't track him at all. Laziness. Kerry just weren't at it the other night. Like there's no point in saying it. I don't know why, but Ruan continued on his run, and it all opened up for him. But Kerry were trying to force the issue at that stage. Um, but yeah, he's definitely a find for Mayo. Yeah, he was not that they needed another midfielder. Yeah, I know <laughs> <laughs> it's another reason why Aiden O'Shea shouldn't be midfielder because he got plenty there. But um, he was one of the, one of the good players against Dublin. I know it's very hard to look into that game, but he was one person who did come out of it with a bit of glory. He's probably been the best player in the league so far. Yeah, no, definitely has. Uh, Shane McGuigan, uh, two five. Christopher Bradley, six points. McGuigan got two for, two three from play. Um, Derry put manners on the Leitrim rising. Um. <laughs> Are we a little bit enthusiastic? A little bit like Leash last year, really, Conan, isn't it? Like, I mean, the top Division 4, which you're expected to do, coming off a, a league win, even like Leash celebrated win and lifted yeah. a cup in Crow Park. I don't care who you are, you still lift a cup in Crow Park. Then you're going into the championship with more confidence. It worked for Leash last year. You know, it could potentially work for Derry again. Definitely Christopher Bradley, him back, he's a great player. And McGuigan, they're the two slot nail yeah. Fellas, and for whatever reasons, you don't always see them in the in the forward line no, for Derry. And now McGuigan's young enough, like so he's got a, a, a massive future ahead of him. Bradley has been somebody who like Sockney have been dominant in Derry for five years, so, and he's been centre forward, their main man, sort of. So people always wanted yeah. to see Bradley in, but um, it's only a slip of a fella, isn't he? Yeah, that's it. But he seems to be sort of uh, committed this year. He's still have Endelin running around. Like McKeg's off the leash a bit more. He's played midfield in a couple of games, centre half back mostly. Like they have a they have a good team. Like they're they're not an amazing team, but when they went to Division 4, everyone was just like, ah, like there was a big outcry in there. He's never been there. Same with Leash, probably. And 
Yes, and now they're just sort of back up to where they are and see how we get on Division 3. Sounding yeah. like Keen Ward now, trying to play it down. But could McGuigan and Bradley, like, I mean, you talk about your style of play. McGuigan and Bradley don't really come from a culture in Slough Nail of getting back ahead of the ball and doing all that do- dog work. They work hard, but they like to work hard to turn over the ball high up the field. So I wonder, it'd be interesting to see, have our Derry playing a really defensive style it doesn't look with those two forwards you're probably not playing to no, their strengths if it is and they have Emma Bradley as well playing centre forward Like so he's the he's, guy he's very good yeah, yeah and he's been playing midfield a lot as well but like that's where he was playing but they're playing centre forward this year and so you have Pori Cassidy the Sock Neal midfielder at wing forward and Kieran McFall has come back he's from Emma Bradley's club he's wing forward as well he was out in America with so Jamie they're your Connelly. workers they're your workers but two good players as well like you know so they can get back and just leave the forward line in place so yeah, I don't, it's going to be hard because obviously they've played Division 4 teams the whole year and now they're going to the Ulster Championship so it'll be, I don't know, it'll be a big step up for them but it's I good will. to see. Yeah, no, it's good to see obviously for you. So the winners of Performance of the Weekend is a joint uh, joint winners so we've got two lucky pants from Paddy Power. It's Matty Donnelly and Colin McShane so they're just brilliant. Uh, McShane finished with 1-4, Matty Donnelly 3 from play. Um, not only that, Donnelly was back in defence uh, with a flying block on Colin Baskell and he followed it up with a knee to the side of the head I'm pretty sure as well which was accidental but it was just a brilliant performance from those two it has definitely warmed the cockles of GA supporters in how to take on Dublin and Croke Park and how to match up and how to go say we're going to try and take you on not just try to contain you and like I mean we definitely should be more enthusiastic based on that because if Tyrone can do it everybody else can do it and now we can go up and actually analyse games. I've been so bored, Conan. I'm not going to lie. Analyzing <laughs> Dublin's games again. Yeah. Like even after the All Ireland final last year, we didn't even analyse the game all that much because it's all like, well, Dublin won it by you know matching uh, by. Uh, Tyrone had a good 15 minutes. Out, out muscle, out, you know, out muscle and the running game didn't. The running game wasn't good enough for Dublin, and <laughs> but it, it was just constant same analysis from Dublin, no matter who they played. Galway, Donegal, all these teams. And it just got so boring. They weren't asking questions of Dublin. Mm. It was just the same old analysis. And like, I mean, for variety in our show, thanks lads. Because like, <laughs> seriously, it's just, now it gives our preview show an awful lot more to talk about. Jesus, wh- what are we going to do against Dublin now? How are Dublin going to deal with this? Yeah. Isn't it just fantastic? Like, I'm really happy. Like, you, you can't read hugely into the league, but you can read into a new tactical shift. And that's what this is, clearly. And that, we just wait now on the other teams to see Tyrone having beaten Dublin in their own backyard. It is their own backyard. With these tactics, there are two men inside scoring one seven between them. And now it's up to the rest of you to see what you can do. And that's it. So like, I mean, Maddie Donnelly and Cotton McShane, well deserving of performance of the weekend. So that's it. Conan, thanks for coming in today. No problem at all. It's a pleasure. No bother. We have a day in lieu for this now and we're out the door very <laughs> soon. So there you go. Right, we'll be back on Thursday with the very final round. So we'll go through all the permutations we've touched on them today and we'll talk to you then. Good luck.